charge of me. Are you all right with the microphones down there? There's lots of people, noises. I think they're probably just visiting. The visitors, or they're coming. Oh, people are coming. Excellent, welcome. More people, this is great. Welcome. Good thing I waited. Yeah. Oh, it's raining. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. If you don't mind, I'll just wait because it sounds like there's more people coming in from the rain. No. Oh, oh no, obviously, but <laughs> joining us for this fantastic panel. I think we might start. I'm not sure if people are coming. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, welcome to the panel. It's our, our discussion this afternoon. Uh, what does it mean to protect an eyewitness in the age of social media? Uh, this raises all sorts of questions, given how many... Um, how much we rely on eyewitnesses to provide us with UGC content um, or eyewitness media content um, and what it means for them, which sometimes we don't really appreciate. Um, we maybe don't consider the consequences when somebody snaps a picture or a video and then shares it widely. And they maybe are only sharing it with a small network of friends, but it can suddenly go viral and be seen all over the world. So the impact on the individual is something we're definitely going to be um, considering a lot, the ethics and things like that. Um, so just to introduce ourselves, my name is Sue Llewellyn and I'm a former BBC journalist. I spent 15 years in the TV newsroom and for the last eight years I've been doing social media strategy and training and have trained around four and a half thousand journalists how to use social media to find eyewitnesses. So, um, and obviously trying to instill in them best practice. There are quite a lot of case studies that we're going to be showing you today and we're not pointing the finger at any one individual for bad practice um, and many of them have indeed improved. It's more that it's a sort of generic thing across the board. So we really want to try and encourage everybody to do things uh, a, bit, a bit better for the eyewitnesses. So to introduce the wonderful panel that we have here, um, I'm just gonna go down the line. Uh, to my right is uh, Dr. Claire Wardle, who is the research director at the Tower Center for Digital Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. She's also the co-founder of the Eyewitness Media Hub. I'm sure you'll hear more about that in a minute. Fergus Bell, next to her, is a news consultant and founder of Dig Deeper Media. He used to be UGC editor at AP and is a co-founder of the online news association's social news gathering ethics code. Mal Maliki Brown, who's uh, down there at the end, not quite at the end, is managing editor with Reportedly, um, a social news service which covers conflict, human rights, and social movements. He used to be editor, news editor at Storyful, um, and in a few weeks, he joins the New York Times video team. Joss Stearns, at the end, is the director of journalism and sustainability at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation and the founder of verificationjunkie.com, a growing director of tools for verifying eyewitness media and UGC content. Um, as a member of the First Draft Coalition, he writes about eyewitness media through the lens of community engagement, and that's one of the things he's going to be talking to us about today. So what I'm going to ask um, all the panelists to do is to present a bunch of case studies and raise various issues, and we'll just go through each one, one by one, and then we'll have hopefully lots of time for questions, and I'd really like it if you can get sort of you know, anything that you'd like to ask us. So if, I'm going to start with Claire, if she'd like to um, kick off. Hi. Somebody said, make sure you put the microphone in the right place so it doesn't look like a moustache. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Uh, Sue, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and I think one thing I'd say is uh, I've similarly been training journalists for a long time. And when we had the Brussels attacks a couple of weeks ago, I just felt like, why are we still 
you know, when you look at newsroom practices, we keep having these sessions at conferences, and they're not necessarily changing behavior. And not to say that this session is going to change behavior either, but um, I just think as an industry, this is something that we just have to keep talking about. Um, and so I'm going to open with this image that many of you saw. Uh, this isn't an eyewitness image. This was actually taken by a photojournalist who was on her way to Geneva. She's from Georgia, um, and she took this image. Now, there's, there's lots of questions here about the ethics of whether people have shown it or anything else. But what I wanted to raise was she actually talked to journalists about her experience of taking that photo. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is because she's a journalist, she got asked to talk about her experience, but most eyewitnesses never get asked what was it like to, to go through this. And when you read what she says, she said, you know, I'm still living with this sense of I should have done something. I left them. I didn't help those women. I, I ran away. We were worried about the, a third explosion. And I'm, I feel really guilty about that. And what does that mean as a photojournalist? Should I just take that picture or not? Should I put it on Facebook or not? You know, what do I do now? And so I think it's worth reading that because what she talks about is what we hear from eyewitnesses when we go and talk to them about their experiences. And it's exactly the same. And until you've been in that moment of experiencing a really shocking experience. You know, yes, we'll talk, you know, Fergus has got some great case studies of the way that journalists can soft, sometimes chase eyewitnesses and say, please, can you contact me? Please, can you contact me? And they're trying to do their job, but an eyewitness has just witnessed an explosion or an eyewitness has just been in an active shooter situation on a US campus. Um, and by reading that, you get a real sense from her about what it feels like to have just witnessed something traumatic and to have captured content. So um, we did some work at the Eyewitness Media Hub after the, the Charlie Hebdo attacks and actually talked to eyewitnesses in Paris, five of them, about their experiences. But also AP wrote uh, a great interview with Geordie Meir, who was the, the man who captured the shooting of the police officer out of his window. And it's really worth reading that account because he says, I shouldn't have captured that A because I put myself in danger. If they turned around, they would have seen me holding the phone. But he said, I put that on Facebook because I put everything on Facebook. And I didn't think through the fact that his family, they were going to see him die you know, on a screen, and I didn't think through what that would mean long term. I simply put it onto Facebook because I thought, I have to share this. But after 15 minutes, he had a change of heart, and he took that video down from Facebook. But by that time, it had been taken by a friend and uploaded to YouTube, and it got used by news organizations all, the, all around the world. So now Geordie Meir has this incredible guilt about the fact that the family saw it, um, the fact that it will live in perpetuity, it exists everywhere, and it was he who captured that. And he said, I'm not a journalist, I don't have training in this, I just responded in a way that I do all the time in life by documenting, but this was different, this was something I had never been prepared for. So these are some of the other quotes that we received from different eyewitnesses, really underlining this fact, you know, I was in a state of shock, I needed to share my experience. Somebody else saying, I used Instagram because it's an extension of my life. Somebody else saying, I wasn't looking for fame, I just wanted the French people to be aware of the atrocities of the attacks. Some of the reactions. I thought to myself, they are everywhere and on the lookout for anything. They crashed my mobile with over 200 calls in less than 30 minutes, talking about journalists. I soon realized broadcasters would call me without even thanking me and use all of my videos. Somebody else, I was very surprised to see it on the lunchtime bulletins. I understood I could do nothing to stop it from being broadcast. And finally, I was horrified. I thought about deleting my Twitter account. So when you speak to eyewitnesses and you hear the same things again and again about their experiences, you start to see real patterns. Um, lots of people talking about money. Some people said I did receive money, but I actually gave that money to charity or I gave money to the magazine. Nobody said, oh, you know, this was great for me. <laughs> I made money. So, you know, I think payment will probably, probably come up in our discussions. Um, but often eyewitnesses are saying, I don't want to get paid. Either I want a credit or I want to thank you or I did it because I wanted to document something. Um, so the motivations of eyewitnesses are really important to consider. Um, and then people reflecting back, it made me realize how fast news travels and how closely we are watched. And this is really, really important. Often when we talk to journalists, they'll say, well, they posted it on Instagram. It's fair game. Don't they know it's public? Well, lots of people on their Instagram account, they have 50 followers, they post pictures of cats for their family, and they have no idea that journalists can do a geolocation search and find their content. It's never even considered to them that that their material would be findable. Um, and that came through a lot, this idea, I don't know how a journalist found me. How did they find me so quickly? I didn't realize that we were being watched. Um, somebody else is a voyeuristic side, a vulture-like 
a quality that I don't like, but they're doing their job. Um, and somebody else saying, I took risks, I think, and today I believe I'm lucky because behind a camera, things seem unreal to you. Um, and we'll talk, I think, a lot more about safety here, but when news organizations are asking, please go out into a storm, or please go out and send us your pics, um, actually, that's a form of commissioning. Um, and lots of people saying, you know, I, I crossed a police line and I shouldn't have done. None of these eyewitnesses have gone through hostile environment training. Um, and so I think there's, a, there's an issue here about understanding that they don't understand the risks. And finally, um, my advice to eyewitnesses would be to protect themselves, defend their rights. And somebody else saying, a picture that's online stays there, so it becomes hard when you want to move on. What annoys me now is that if you do, do a search for me online, there are as many references to AFP and, and her picture as there are articles connected to my actual work. So again, as journalists, we often focus on the breaking news event and forget that this stays. It stays on live blogs, and therefore it stays in search, and people's names are connected to that. Um, and we did research a couple of years ago and found that only... 16% Sam of uh, pieces of uh, user generated content were credited and at the time I would stand at conferences and say this is disgusting news organizations should be crediting this and now from talking to lots of eyewitnesses I've completely changed my mind because lots of eyewitnesses don't want their name connected with a breaking news event for this very reason so it goes back to the importance of talking to an eyewitness and asking do you want what do you want to be credited and if so how do you want to be credited um, so, this is an, uh, just one case study, and I've, I've blurred out the news organization, but this was from about a year ago in the UK, an eyewitness secretly filmed some racist chanting on their mobile phone. We often see these, sort of, see these sorts of examples, and it was football fans, and Europeans will understand, <laughs> sometimes football fans can get a little bit... Um, agitated. Anyway, so he secretly filmed this chant and it got picked up by a large news organization and they went back and forth and he said, yes, I can use it. Um, and so the video is still up and I've blurred it out, but his Twitter handle is in the corner and in the news story, his Twitter handle is there, even though this person had deliberately tweeted and said, please, can you remove my name? And so, you know, this is, this is still up here. He tweeted that a year ago, and it's still up there. There's really no excuse for when eyewitnesses specifically ask for something. And you see this with eyewitnesses saying, yes, you can use it, but with a credit or not a credit. And it gets completely ignored, um, and this, this happens. And it's mostly because journalists are very, very busy, but this doesn't help um, when people get ignored. And if you are interested in reading about some of these, we did five case studies um, with different eyewitnesses. Uh, we'd done a piece of research and we'd captured a lot of this eyewitness media. And we went back to the people who had created the eyewitness media and said, how did you feel that your piece of content was used by the Daily Mail, the Guardian, the BBC? And most of them said, what do you mean? They had no idea that their content had been used. Um, and so we wrote up these case studies and talked to them about what it was like and had they been asked permission, did they want crediting. Um, it's, it's really fascinating examples of how eyewitnesses feel when they're uh, being ignored. And one of the worst examples um, was a guy who had simply uh, filmed five minutes of footage with his girlfriend on an aeroplane saying, look how little leg room there is. The Daily Mail was doing a story about the size of legroom, did a YouTube search, and even though this film had five views, they took that YouTube video, downloaded it, re-uploaded it to their player, and, and still it's up there now with pre-roll ads against it. So you see a lot of examples, even around Brussels, of, uh, but there being pre-roll ads against footage from Brussels. And sometimes I think if we really want to stop this practice, we should be going to the advertisers saying, how do you feel that your your, you know, your, the thing you're trying to sell is up against some graphic imagery from Brussels. So I'd quite like to flip that idea. Um, and just lastly, this is another example of a woman in Australia who happened to take a selfie uh, in a bar. And about 20 minutes after this, she took this photo. Uh, the guy in the background, he's famous in Australia, it's called Red Foo. Somebody's nodding. He's like, oh, yes. Uh, and so where, he was glassed in the pub, somebody threw a glass at him, and so journalists did their job and they looked for geolocated Instagram pictures from the pub, and this one came up. So it was used, here's an example, uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald, the screenshot was used in the video. Um, you can see against her Instagram picture, lots of journalists saying, can we use your picture? And she's saying, no, no, no. Mm. Now technically, anybody can embed that Instagram image, because legally, and we're doing a workshop later about copyright and eyewitness media, you can embed an Instagram um, picture without asking permission. 
But here, they've scraped it and added it into their own video with a pre-roll ad. So that's going against what she, uh, what she wanted. But the bigger issue is, if you do a search for red food glassing, you get lots of pictures of him and this girl who happened to take a selfie 20 minutes before he got glassed. So there's just these examples to show you, which is there is a long tail to this. Um, it does have an impact. And I think impact is one of the most important words to consider. By embedding a tweet or a photo or a video, somebody has got 50 followers on Instagram, but on BuzzFeed, more than a million people see that. So even though it's copyright, it's fine to do it. What are the, what are the implications for that? And what does that mean for search and the rest of it? So just lastly, Best practice, and I know this is very difficult in a newsroom during a breaking news situation, but we really try to say, where possible, try and ensure that an eyewitness knows you are using their footage. And in fact, I talked to Mark Little yesterday from Twitter to say, in your speech, you were really emphasizing how Twitter is there to allow people to embed tweets in their publications. And I said, that's a great business strategy for Twitter, but what does it mean for somebody who didn't expect their tweet to move off the platform and to be on the front page of BuzzFeed? So, and Mark was saying, and then Bert Herman from Storify was saying, yes, we used to alert people when their tweets were included in a Storify. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Really nice feature. And so Mark was like, oh, maybe we should do that at Twitter. So let's see what happens. But I think the alerting of people when they're footage gets used will be a really important thing. Secondly, think about the impact of embedding social content, which I've just said, uh, and this aspect of abuse. So often when eyewitnesses capture content, they then get abused by people on Twitter or Instagram saying, why did you shoot that? You should have stopped to help, or you're taking money for this, you shouldn't take money for it. And so again, when you embed content, it's easy to simply click the reply button and directly target the eyewitness. Um, and then thinking about connecting them to an event, does that place them in a vulnerable situation? And we're gonna talk a lot more about that, and Mal's gonna talk about protecting eyewitnesses from a kind of a technology point of view. And finally, where possible, ask eyewitnesses how they want to be credited, but also explain the potential impact of being linked to, cov to, to coverage, because we're seeing more and more that, that there is a long tail to this. Um, so yes, so happy to answer any questions at the end. Fergus Bell. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm going to No, okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, dive into some case studies that will build on what, what Claire has said. Um, my name is Fergus Bell, as, as you know, and I used to do a lot of stuff at the AP on UGC, and I now help other newsrooms do that. So I'm going to dive straight into an example, um, and I'll reiterate that all of my examples are representative of the problem, and if, you, if I am targeting, you know, mentioning a specific organization, it, it, it's purely for illustrative purposes. So this was an event that happened uh, at a campus in Oregon. And you can see on the screen here that this person has said, OMG, oh my god, there's someone shooting on campus. And straight away we have uh, a news organization, hi, are safe, not even are you safe, can you DM me when you find shelter, I'm a reporter for uh, at said news organization. And straight underneath, asking students to DM you right now is pathetic. What we, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort on um, engagement strategy, but this is, this is tweets from your reporters uh, linked to your brand, and, this is, and the, these are out there for everyone to see. It's undoing any work that you, that you might have, that, you know, that you spend so much time and effort um, doing. We need to think about the say, so this is, this is how we directly protect people. By communicating with people who are in a dangerous situation, you are potentially putting them at risk. We've seen occasions where uh, increasingly perpetrators of crimes are monitoring their actions on social media. They are monitoring the impact that, that they are having and this person has tweeted it, but they have tweeted it to their network. By a journalist communicating with them, it can amplify that tweet. And if that tweet is amplified and, and appears on the screen of a perpetrator, we could put them in, in danger, especially if they say where they're hiding or, or, or they're sharing a photo. Um, also, this and our, and our action in doing that is seen by everyone and, and our audiences, and that, that is not good for us. So this, this woman then followed up, students are running everywhere, holy God. The situation is still um, ongoing, and yet another news organization, Kayla, please stay safe and keep out of danger. Only when you are safe and if willing to speak, please let us know. Now, if this person was hiding and that journalist had, and they hadn't turned off their you know, the volume on their notifications, that act 
could make their phone beep and alert people to their... So it, it's all very, worked very well to say, well, they don't have to check their phone until they're safe. Actually, the timing of such messages can be really important when you're, when you're protecting um, these individuals. And you can see underneath uh, the response from, from some, pe some people on Twitter to that kind of outreach. So I've got a, a couple more. This, was, this person received hundreds and hundreds of requests. Can you DM me? Can you follow me back so you can DM? Uh, I, would, you like to be, would you be free to speak about this? She had hundreds of requests all asking the same thing. There is no way that you, can, that you can respond to all of that. There is no way that you're going to respond to that if you've been targeted while you're being targeted. Um, and it, it's just not the way you work. If you get a nuisance phone call, you're very li it, unlikely to engage with them on the phone. You're very likely to put the phone down. This is the equivalent of a nuisance phone call, and it potentially puts people at risk. It wasn't just... The, so what, what we also see is... No, no, it's, it's up there, it's up there. Um, what we also see in newsroom is, newsrooms are bad processes in place that mean we make this situation worse. So um, uh, three, three um, tweets from, this is from ABC. Hi Kayla, I'm an editor with ABC News. We hope you're safe. Can we contact you to find out more about what's happening? Hi, uh, I'm with ABC in New York. Can you follow me to DM if you're in a safe spot? Hi, uh, Kayla, are you okay? I work with ABC News. If you can follow me, I would love to talk to you. Please be safe. Uh, but it wasn't just uh, ABC. I'm with Fox. Can you DM me when you're safe? I'm with Fox. Can you DM me when you're safe? I'm with Fox. Can you DM me when you're safe? I'm with CNN. Are you okay? I'm with CNN. Um, can I DM you my number? I'm with CNN. Follow me back. Can you call me? So the... Individually, they're doing what journalists should do, but as an organization, as a large, and this is, gonna, this is going to be a problem in a large newsroom where you have different programming, uh, programs, different, uh, different teams, different shifts. This is, and I've used these examples, but you see this in, in all large news organizations at the moment, uh, with only a few exceptions. You need to coordinate in order to, to reduce the risk to this individual, and you need to um, coordinate to stop harassing them. This is what the, what the lady tweeted um, after the event was over. Uh, and I think that this, this speaks to the point that, yes, you have the pressure, yes, you need to chase the story, but no, you're not going to get the story if you do this. So, yes, you might, your editor might say, well, we need to do this, but it's not going to work. All you're going to do is look bad um, and, and, and make someone potentially put someone at risk or certainly make them upset. So if you're a reporter looking for a story, read these next words carefully, I am not interested. And I wonder why. I mean, <laughs> so that, that's, that's an ongoing situation. I have, I have um, an example of where you can protect people and you can, uh, if, and you can get a lot more information without the need to ha harass them if you just pay attention to a social feed. So this is, you know, you'll often send your request. This is, this is also linked to the, you know, I, my retweets, uh, you know, retweets are not endorsements or these views are my own. No one ever goes and looks at your profile to look at your bio to, see, to check whether what you're tweeting is going to be an endorsement or if it's your own opinions. We do that as journalists to protect ourselves, but, but the majority of us fail to, to do the same thing or to look at the social feed um, that, is, that is being created by these individuals. We just send, we're just outgoing, we're not putting in. I'm gonna name a lot of people here in these examples, but you, I'm gonna show you that it's, it's very common. So this was, the, Tunis this was the, the attack on the beach in, in Tunisia where a lot of people died. Uh, and this is on Instagram. Hello, I'm a journalist at RT in London. Are you at the scene of the Tunisian hotel attack? First comment on there, I think this is a completely reasonable comment. They are, they are the first journalist. And then you can see underneath, you know, three more people are asking, and then um, the, the user, five to six persons, pe people are killed from the boat. Uh, I'm here, can't talk, I only have three photos. And then straight away you have a Belgian journalist uh, asking, are you at the scene? Um, then uh, ITV, would it be possible for IT News to use these pictures? I'm with the New York Daily News. Then we've got BuzzFeed, um, and the, one, the reason why I've highlighted this is because this is an automated request using 
uh, at all. So they, they are not, this is not a personal message to this individual. This, they've, they've seen the image and they've sent the automated requests. Um, then, you know, there's people jumping in who are not journalists, and then there's someone from CBS asking if you can use the, if they can use the pictures. And then there's messages from a lot of other journalists from all over the world asking uh, for permission to use it. Now, if they'd have actually looked, this person gave their phone number. Uh, and I think I'm going to call out the, uh, the journalist from France. I need your dialing code. I'm a journalist from France. <laughs> you, like, it's quicker to put that into Google and find out the dialing code than to put it onto an, into an Instagram comment. So, and this is all playing out for everyone to see, and you can see people jumping in there. Now, this person was in a dangerous situation. They were under pressure. They gave, they've given their phone number. They said that there's three photos. They said that they can't talk. They've specifically said they can't talk. And hundreds of journalists from the same, or uh, and fr multiple journalists from the same organization are making a request to this individual. I'm gonna highlight one, one example of what I think is a good, uh, is it, there is no solution to this yet. I mean, there's a solution to managing it so that only one person asks, and also reading this, but, um, and some of these are a little bit out of order, but, uh, this is George Sargent at Reuters. Hi, I've just seen these photos you posted today from Seuss. I hope you are safe. I work for Reuters and we're reporting on this blast. Did you take these photos? If so, can Reuters have your permission to include them on our news service? We distribute worldwide on TV and online and we include a restriction of, of an on-screen credit to you if you wish. Many thanks and please stay safe. George Sargent with his email. Now, if you have to do it this way, I think that's a pretty good example of, of how to do it. It's polite, it's sensitive, it gives all the information. It, it, it's a clear request um, and an explanation as to, what, as to how you're going to use the content. It's not ideal to do it this way. I mean, you can, we can also call the guy up because he gave his phone number if that's, if that's the right thing to do, but I don't feel like this protects people. I don't feel like it protects us. I think it makes us look awful. Um, these pictures were then used uh, in a number of different ways. They were not credited. They were taken from Instagram. Everyone knew the source of this. We could determine that this, it wasn't difficult to find the original source. None of them are credited. Um, some of them were just credited from Instagram and just taken without permission because we could see that uh, little permission was given, if any. And then this one, and this is an Italian example, um, someone just took a screenshot of Instagram from their mobile phone and then embedded that screenshot of the, and credited it to Instagram. Like, I don't think I need to say what's, what's, what's wrong with, with this approach. It just, it's not, it's not journalism if you, um, it, you can do so much more journalism. Just the last, last point I, I want to make with an example, and this, this builds on what Claire said, there's a big difference between assignments and discovery. Discovery is when you're searching for content. Um, assignments can be, can be good, and we know a lot of people use assignments. There is a big difference between uh, an assignment where you're not putting someone at risk. Here comes the snow, seeing any in your area, send us your pictures on Facebook. I don't think there's anyone that's gonna argue that that, that, that is bad. But there are other assignments. Do you have any pictures of what's going on at the school? This was during a school shooting. Um, no, because I didn't think to take pictures while I thought my life was in jeopardy. So we can't say assignment, we can't say assigning people to, to take pictures is good or bad. We have to say it's sometimes appropriate, it's sometimes not. But you can't just, it's not a clear, it's not a clear cut policy. And then um, I know we're going to talk about ethics and, and Josh is going to talk about ethics as well. Um, I'm part of the ONA and we've released uh, an ethics code that focuses on a lot of these considerations. The red box shows all of the ones that relate to um, considering the safety, emotional safety, physical safety, technical safety of, of um, citizen journalists. Um, and we've got a lot of support so far for this code. If you want to read more about it, it's there. If you want to join it, then, then there's the email. Oh, yeah, Mark. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I've reportedly, we rely on uh, people who are providing information through social media, um, and we cover 
social movements, social justice movements, human rights, and, and a lot of conflict, and there is a lot of conflict out there. Um, and we uh, approach people um, and bring people into the conversation, and I hope we do it in, a, in an ethical way, um, but we're subject to mistakes as well. What I'm going to talk about um, is eyewitnesses and people that you can find through social media. You know, they're, they're so sources, and as journalists, we have a duty to protect those sources and how we communicate with them. Um, and the revelations uh, of Edward Snowden, they showed us, show, show us that we must take much greater care in, uh, uh, in how we communicate with people in order to um, ensure their safety. Because we know that governments and other agencies are monitoring electronic communications. Um, yesterday's panel with Julie Pacetti, she uh, outlined how uh, government communications headquarters, uh, GCHQ in the UK, uh, intercepted Amnesty's um, uh, com electronic communications with their sources and activists who were reporting back to them and held them in a database. And that revelation was very damaging um, for Amnesty because how can you now, as a source, trust that you're, you're, you're not going to be put at risk? Um, and in the realm of social, we know that that's monitored too. Um, you know, geez, if I were a journalist in the UK, I might think GCHQ are not really interested in uh, my talking to somebody from Egypt or from Angola or somewhere like that. But what about at the other side? Um, somebody who's a technology provider uh, in the West uh, was talking to me recently and told me about how he was communicating with an editor in Egypt. And the following day, by face Facebook Messenger, which you would think is private, and the following day, Egyptian security arrived at that office with a transcript of the private messages that they were having back and forth and questioned the editor um, about that. Uh, so that's one example of how, um, of how it's intercepted and monitored by securities, particularly if you're on a list um, uh, mo monitoring people. Um, some people understand this. I'm just going to flick to this uh, screen here. This is somebody who got in touch with me recently um, and said, you know, this story that I have for you can't be discussed through Facebook. Let's find another means of, of discussing that. Um, uh, and other people don't understand this as well. Um, and as um, Claire and the others uh, pointed out, they, they don't understand that people beyond their community uh, can, can post stuff. They don't understand what's public, what's private very often. Um, uh, one uh, recently, in recent weeks, um, a anti-corruption investigator and journalist in an African country got in touch with me asking me questions about an investigation that he was doing into um, misuse of funds by the president. This guy has been imprisoned twice and uh, detained without trial twice, and I told him it was, it's not secure to talk to me on Facebook, let's move the conversation to Signal. Um, but he kept talking to me, and he just, he, he just didn't, um, didn't seem to be concerned about it. Um, and uh, if they were monitoring, they would certainly be monitoring him in that country. Um, another person who I contacted in Sierra Leone once during the Ebola um, outbreak, break, there was, the story behind this is that there was um, an elderly woman who was sick in her home, uh, the authorities came, thought that she had Ebola, wanted to remove her, and her grandsons, who were members of a youth militia in the town, uh, protected the house, and the military turned up and shot two people and killed them. Um, and there was an eyewitness who was there, who, uh, this is a mining town in Sierra Leone, and he filmed the police uh, racing down the street to it, and I found him, he had posted it publicly, um, and he got back in touch with me and said, I don't want to be attributed. He said, feel free to use the information as long as I am going to be okay. Um, so he was surprised that I found him and, um, you know, was okay for it to be made public, but um, didn't quite understand. So understanding all of this as journalists affects um, how we approach uh, sources and eyewitnesses on social our decision to contact them in the first place. There are many, many re uh, reasons not to contact somebody because by doing so you could put them at risk. Um, and how we contact them, um, and as the others have said, even embedding um, content in live blogs and stories as so many publishers are doing um, at the moment uh, as public content. Uh, so here are some of the steps um, that you can take I've tweeted out some of these articles, by the way, um, and uh, with the hashtag for the, for the conference in the last hour. Um, 
quite simply, use Signal, which is in encrypted, uh, and use it on an iPod Touch. And this is advice from our sister publication, uh, the, the Intercept. And why on an iPod Touch? Because I don't know if this is hacked now, but it is possible for somebody to hack my phone, and even without me knowing to be using the microphone and recording what's, what's uh, being said. Uh, an iPod Touch, much less likely, particularly if you're using just a couple of apps like Signal and, uh, and WhatsApp. And that's a picture of Signal in the, on the side there. It's just a marketing picture of it. Um, don't talk with Sean Penn. <laughs> this came out at the time that, um, that uh, oh, what's the name of the, El Chapo was it? El Chapo was, um, was found after Penn um, uh, visited him. And uh, Sean Penn wrote an article and um, Andrew Fish went to town on Sean Penn's article about all of the different security failures um, that, that he had in in his approach to this story. Uh, so, but the, the broader, broader point there is, you know, don't talk with people who may put you or your sources at risk. Um, so a couple of other things. Signal, as I said, uh, uh, on an iPod, if you need to be extra secure, use Jabber OTR off the record, and preferably you could use that with, um, you know, an anonymous account that doesn't describe your name, and as long as you and somebody else um, uh, under, know what the usernames are, you can communicate securely. If you're doing that through Tor particularly, uh, that, will, that will hide your uh, mask your identity on the web, and you should use Tor if you're investigating stuff like that. Major news this week, uh, WhatsApp has encrypted its end-to-end -end communications. So as the Electronic Frontier Foundation say in this article, again, I tweeted it out, um, they say, you know, in one fell swoop, they've brought end-to-end -end encryption to one billion users, you know, a significant um, proportion of the world's population. So upgrade your WhatsApp and uh, start using that, preferably on an iPod Touch as well. Um, and uh, the EFF said about this, you know, it's hard to overstate the importance of it for, for security. Um, and uh, look at Micah Lee, uh, he's a colleague of mine at The, uh, the Intercept, and he uh, writes about these tools and tips and tricks and, and things that you can do to protect uh, your communications and, and secure them. Um, and he's, uh, he's terrific. He was the guy who Edward Snowden first reached out to. And he's uh, written a blog about that as well on, on the site, which is a great read. Um, that's it. Thanks so much. And um, I'm lucky in that I get to talk about some good stories of things that have gone right. Uh, so. We'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can uh, do things better, but also who's out there um, and the models and what we can learn from them doing some of this better. And I'll be sharing, um, or already have shared, a bunch of these links on Twitter as well. Um, I think one of the things that Claire said when she was talking was that uh, sometimes doing and taking into account some of the things that we've been talking about is difficult during a breaking news situation. You've got a lot of other pressures coming at you from your editors and from your news organization with the priorities of trying to get the story first and get it up. Um, we don't always really have the incentives to slow down and to protect eyewitnesses in that moment. So one of the things I want to talk about is actually how we can protect eyewitnesses by engaging our communities before, during, and then after breaking news events, and specifically looking at some of the before work that we can do to actually build cohorts and teams of, of eyewitnesses who uh, have a sense for how they can protect themselves and how you can protect them um, before breaking news happens. It's not always possible, of course, if you're not uh, a local news organization on the scene, but I think even then, uh, places like Reportedly have done a really good job about cultivating sources over a long period of time so that when something happens, they know there's people they can turn to who they can trust and who they have a relationship with. So I want to talk about that relationship building. Um, I work at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation where I direct a project called the Local News Lab and we conduct creative experiments in local news revenue models as well as community engagement. And I also was the founder of Verification Junkie, this online directory of tools for helping you verify eyewitness media. Where these two things come together, I think, is um, when protecting eyewitnesses in the media, I think that work happens before the news breaks and that building communities is a key skill for that. And so the first person I want to talk about is uh, Justin Osiello, who founded a site called Jersey Shore Hurricane News. And this site over the past five years has grown to over 220,000 people uh, who 
actively report with him on breaking news situations, uh, as well as daily news in New Jersey, where I, where I do a lot of my work. And if you watch him engage with his community, it's actually really a beautiful thing. It's in, he's incredibly humble and incredibly generous, always providing um, a lot of guidance along the way and really cultivating a sense so that people who do contribute to the site are doing so in a way that's safe. He models best practices and we'll look a little bit at that. So this was an example during Hurricane Sandy, one of the biggest storms to hit New Jersey shore in recent memory. And um, this was a story, this, these photos started to circulate. It's of a really famous roller coaster that had been swamped by the storm and was largely underwater. And uh, there was a lot of, it was unclear whether this was real or not. A lot of people said, oh, this has to be fake. I can't believe that that's there. And so he actually worked with an eyewitness. The, the picture from Facebook was one of the original ones that was floating around. The um, one with real or fake on it was actually one that an uh, eyewitness for him was able to get, and he worked with that person to go down after it was safe, after the storm had calmed down, um, but to help him verify that this image was true, and then he worked with local police and others to verify that. Uh, another example is recently an eyewitness caught some people dumping um, sand from a dredging operation from a local river on the nearby beach, and the eyewitness knew that he could post this stuff to Jersey Shore or Hurricane News, and Justin would work with him on verifying that and getting the rest of the story. So you can see he's from a f pretty safe distance, staying away from the trucks, not necessarily getting involved in what was happening, but documenting it really well. There's a number of pictures there. And you can see actually in the Facebook comments that it's not just the eyewitness itself, but then other people have jumped in and said, here's something I know about that. And, oh, I think that that's, um, you know, here's the rules on that beach and that sort of thing. So together, this community of 220,000 people are actually reporting out this story. And then Justin, the, the publisher, is taking that and going to the local authorities and checking the facts and coming back and eventually writes a full story on this based on all these eyewitness media accounts. But he has trained and modeled these best practices in ways and taught people how to to take eyewitness media, he calls these 220,000 people not uh, Facebook friends, he calls them contributors. And he always says, whenever he uses one of their photos or evidence that they've gathered, he always says this is from a Jersey Shore Hurricane News contributor, and he always asks for their permission. But he respects them, he considers them part of his news organization in a really active way. Um, and you can see there, he also is very transparent. So in where the arrow is pointing in this last picture here, he's actually saying, here's how this story came together. And he says, somebody posted pictures, then we fact checked, then we did this, then we did that. And he's actually describing the process so that people who are coming to this after the fact and just seeing the end product, the article, actually see how the article was made. And that is another way that he's training his community to um, more safely and securely be these boots on the ground for him. So I think that there's you know, a lot of reasons why we should think about engaging our readers well before breaking news happens. It helps them create better eyewitness footage for us. So if they understand that we want videos that are horizontal instead of vertical, or that we want videos that show landmarks so we can actually verify that where it was taken, that sort of thing. Um, it can make that eyewitness content more useful to us. There's also, they're also more likely to help us debunk misinformation and slow the spread of rumors if they've got some training and sort of news literacy and what to look for uh, during that breaking news. And if they know how to create good, strong eyewitness media that's verifiable, they're gonna be able to spot the stuff that's not. They also will be more aware of their own rights, and I think this is really important too. Like, What are people's rights when they are out recording if a police officer comes up and tells them to stop recording? Um, and they're recording and thinking that they might give it to a news organization, what are their rights? And should, shouldn't they know their rights in advance? Are there ways that we can help them understand their rights? Uh, and then obviously there's the safety piece as well. Um, so we can help make sure that they're operating safely. Uh, we can streamline permissions if we've worked with them in advance and have a relationship with them. So there's all these reasons why this engagement in advance can be really beneficial to our work. These are um, two documents out of a series of 12 that were created by the, um, by the podcast On the Media, which is a U.S. podcast that reports on media uh, in the U.S. And, and around the world. Um, 
But they started producing about two years ago a breaking news consumer's handbook, which I thought was this fascinating act. They're, in many ways, they're an industry news source. They report about the media. Most of the people who consume the podcast are folks in the media, although there's a slightly broader audience than that. But they realized that they kept, as Claire was saying, they kept trying to bring these issues to bear about how we're operating as news organizations and journalists in breaking news, and they were really frustrated. So they said, well, we're going to start empowering the audience then to start um, helping the audience actually think about breaking news in different ways and have, helping the audience interpret what we're saying, all the code words we use, all the... Um, the conventions that we fall into when we get into breaking news. So they produced this first breaking news consumer handbook. It was so popular that they've created a whole series now over different topics. And the one that I wanted to highlight here uh, was the breaking news consumer's handbook for eyewitness media for bearing witness. Um, specifically, this came out of the fact that so many videos over the past year of police violence um, have been circulating and more and more people were seeing documentation and bearing witness as an important civic act that they wanted to be a part of, uh, especially in communities that were dealing with police violence and intimidation. And so they felt like they wanted to create something for those people to, to better strengthen them as eyewitnesses. So the, here's a newsroom trying to empower their communities through this really active information. And what's happened through that is now, almost without fail, you guys have probably seen this too, every time breaking news happens, somebody takes to Twitter or Facebook and shares these images. Um, you know, ev somebody gets on and says, hey, you know, as we're hearing this flood of, of rumors and, and this, you know, bits and pieces of uh, story coming out of this breaking news event, remember these things. So this has actually become a really interesting resource where people are using it um, well beyond the news organization now as a sort of an act of solidarity, eyewitness solidarity, uh, helping educate and remind people um, about these issues. So I thought that was really interesting. And you can see their whole series. I just, I tweeted a link to it and there's also a link here on the slide. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, and actually before I get to this piece, the, the one other piece I wanted to mention is this is, you know, a news organization and audience members circulating this. What if we had some partnership with some of the platforms so that, you know, Twitter during a breaking news event might be able to give on the media uh, some promoted tweets to make sure that these kinds of images get highlighted. Or, um, you know, Facebook, we know now with Facebook Live and other Facebook products that people are posting images of Facebook or Instagram. What if Instagram had a little bar, gave up some of their advertising space to tell people about their rights? Now that everybody is doing acts of journalism, with the cameras in their pockets, how can we make sure that everybody has even the baseline understanding of what their rights are when they're operating in that way? And how can the platforms help us do that? So that's something I'm really interested in. Then finally, uh, you know, in addition to the, the ONA ethics guide, which you all should take a look at, I wanted to offer this as another resource. This is an ethical guideline that's meant for human rights organizations. It was produced by Witness. But there's actually a lot of great content in this that um, can be really useful for news organizations thinking about how you plan for uh, breaking news events and how you ethically work with eyewitnesses. Um, and there's some really good overlaps between this and the ONA guide that's specifically written for journalists. So that, that guide I think is really applicable, but I think sometimes it's useful to see also um, this other context. So this is a snapshot of two checklists that they put out for this. And there's two there's a, it, this is a bigger guide than what I'm going to go over, but there's two pieces that they really focus on. One um, that we haven't talked about too much yet is that the responsibility to the individuals who are filmed. So we've talked a lot about the responsibility to the people doing the filming or taking the pictures, but inherent in that, there's also the people in the pictures. And so there's some good, there's some good um, questions that witness asks about how do you obtain consent if you're using an eyewitness video and you're not on the scene, how do you actually obtain consent for the person who's being recorded and what are your responsibilities there? What was the audi intended audience and usage when the video was upload, uploaded? And how are the safety, dignity, and privacy of the people represented in the film or the picture um, going to be changed by your usage of that? 
And then going back to the responsibility to the filmer, to the eyewitness themselves, obviously we talked a lot about finding the source and treating them well. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, also, you know, we've talked a little bit about considering the source's safety during breaking news. But then there's another piece too, which I think we've touched on a little bit, but I want to kind of put a finer point on, which is a tension between anonymity and verification, which is, comes really into play, especially with human rights videos. Um, but there's times in which we need to know the, a lot of details to verify something. But those details may not, if made public, um, may cause serious problems. And so we have to balance this anonymity and verification. And Witness has done a lot of work looking at blurring of faces in videos um, and making sure that there's anonymity for people who, you know, if it's a video of protest that some repressive regime can't look at that video of a protest and then identify people and go after them. Um, so we need to be thinking about anonymity versus verification and Witness uh, has created a couple apps called Obscuracam and Camera V that, also, that try to make the balancing this anonymity of verification um, possible and, and useful. So I've got some slides here. You can see, um, and the other thing that, they, that YouTube, uh, they've worked with YouTube around face blurring. And so they've got good guides at witness.org on how to use YouTube's face blurring tools as well. So I wanted to end um, there just to say, I think we can be thinking really far in advance about how we're modeling best practices how we're being transparent about the way that we operate, um, how we can even do and participate in trainings with citizen journalists. Justin from Jersey Shore Hurricane News actually regularly um, participates in other trainings for citizen journalists, not ones that he even produces. But he's always there trying to help spread this gospel and how we can just engage with people in ways that can make sure that they're more safe and that we get eyewitness content that really works for us. Hello, that's yeah. better. Um, I think that was really uh, interesting. Thanks very much to everybody. What really struck me was the reaction from you, the audience there, of the absolute horror um, at some of the examples you were seeing of the bad practice. Uh, so it sort of strikes me that we're talking about educating the eyewitnesses into how to cope with this stuff, but what more can be done to educate the journalists? I know these things get tweeted out and shared, but as we can see every single time there's anything going on news-wise, what, oh, I think you can, you're about to answer, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, the, when I joined uh, First Look Media, um, uh, w reportedly as part of First Look Media, we had a weak induction. And we had everything from legal to security. Before I could even use my laptop, I was sent security guidelines on how to install certain things, how to encrypt my drive. So before I even got started, this is how you use your email, this is not how you use your email. I, you know, I don't use e my email on my phone, my professional email, because I can't encrypt it on this. So all of these things, and it was, it was the best induction that I, that I ever had, and I, I learned so much from that. So I think any onboarding of new journalists is a starting point for that, as well as educating within the room and uh, uh, within the, the, the existing staff. Yes, do. I think there's also an issue of um, editors because uh, I teach at Columbia Journalism School and the other day one of our students also works part-time in a very large newsroom and she was talking about the utter fear she gets when the editors are screaming at her to chase the eyewitnesses and she said they've never worked a shift in their life which involved tweet deck columns. They're senior editors who they've never, they've never had to do that work and she said, you know, exactly to Fergus's point, she said, I've worked on shifts with active shooters while I'm being asked to chase, and she said, I'm terrified that the chime alert is gonna go off and I'm gonna put the eyewitness in danger. And she said, how do I tell my editor all of these things that you're teaching us at J School? And so I do think we have an issue with journalists who do this. There are some incredibly good journalists who, who do this every single day, but when there's a big breaking news event, everybody's asked to you know, go on deck and help, and they haven't necessarily been taught these best practices. So I'd love us to do more work with editors, and potentially in editorial guidelines, there should be something that says, during active situations, nobody should contact an eyewitness until we know it's over. Because if, in the old days, it's not like the journalist could cross the police line and chase after an eyewitness, saying, oh, can I just get you on camera saying something? The police line was there for a reason, but now because of this, Anybody can cross that line. And so I think we should have more of that in, in guidelines, specifically saying in certain situations we shouldn't be touching eyewitnesses until it's over. Newsrooms do already have a lot of guidelines and policies in place, particularly around anonymity. So 
you know, there are, and, and those things have been worked out over many years uh, and, and apply to, to legacy media or, or the old ways of doing things. But the, the technology is, is one element, but the kind of approach is, is probably something that is still relevant. So rather than news organizations having to completely start from scratch, it's probably worth building on existing policies around um, anonymity, around sourcing, around uh, communicating with sources, and just uh, bringing in that technical element where we are now with, with social media. It's, it's not writing, it, it's, not, it's not starting from scratch. The other thing, maybe you were absolutely right mentioning the platforms, getting the platforms involved. Have there been any approaches to them to try and get them to, to make um, eyewitnesses more aware that, that any of you know about? Or, you know, for journalists to sort of say, I don't know if there's something in an algorithm that you could have that said, you're now approaching this eyewitness, that, you know, watch out for this. Do you think they've got more there of a responsibility? Been, I mean, there have been platforms who have supported really important work on training and education, but it tend to be supporting work off the platform. So supporting really great organizations that are in the field doing um, these sorts of trainings. And so that's great. That's a, that's a great first step. But the question is, the platforms are where there's an immense reach, and where we might um, be able to have uh, a really huge impact with, with raising and elevating the profile and um, and helping people think about this stuff in a new way. So, and I think one of the challenges with that is there's obviously, especially when it comes to rights and laws, very different guidelines that would need to be presented for different areas, even different states in the US, but obviously internationally that's true. So the question becomes, are, are there partnerships that could be created where the platform doesn't feel like they're taking on the legal liability by providing legal advice on anything like that, which I don't think they'd wanna do, but to work with organizations like Witness and others uh, to help get the safety information and help people figure out where they um, where they can go to get that. You know, so an example of this is a while back there was a whole slew of uh, people Instagramming their ballots. You know, um, this is not breaking news, but there are people saying, "Look, I voted. I'm, here's an Instagram of my ballot." And it turns out that across the United States, the laws vary, but in many states, that's illegal. You're not allowed to post pictures of your ballot because they want to stop people from pay paying you to vote a certain way, right? Um, and so in that situation, ProPublica and a couple other news organizations wrote articles about why you shouldn't Instagram your ballot. But that's a great opportunity, you know, to reach people in a much broader way. And so I, th I wonder when there's these targeted opportunities to really help people think. We use these new technologies. One of the quotes from the eyewitnesses, Claire, that you put up was, I just use it because it's an extension of my life. Mm -hmm. Right, so it becomes a natural thing to document. And so where, where and in what ways can we help people become a little bit more nuanced about how they think about using those technologies? Uh, I just, I'm really interested in something that Josh said about you know, the, the, the platforms having, having a, a place where it says, you know, these are your rights. I actually think it might be worth, better if we take the lead here and, and every news organization has a place where you can see what, you know, where the news organization explains your rights or, you know, put, print it in the, in the physical paper. Y you know, if we're not prepared to do that, then, then why should the networks do it? But it's not in the news organization's interest to tell users their rights because they're quite happy, I think. Is it in the, is it in the social network's interest in, the big pic in their big picture? Because well, so I think I was going to say a couple of years ago, I'd say the platforms wouldn't be interested. But I think now, as news has become more important for them, and we've seen quite a few panels here about this relationship, I think now they're thinking about this much more than they have been for a long time. And I think there's some simpler ways, like you know, promoted tweets or targeted positioning of rights. Because it's not in their interest to see. But I, I think also, if you look at terms and conditions on all the different social networks, they're all different. You speak to a lot of people about the social networks, and they say one thing, and you say, but that's not what it says in your terms of service. Oh, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of ignorance around a lot of these but things. But as, as a gesture, I think we have to be, you know, we can't say you need to, you need to tell everyone about their rights as it relates to news. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if, if you are printing it or publishing it, I think you also have a, a duty to do that. Just picking up on the rights issue, what about the right to change your mind? If you've decided that you, it's, it's okay initially, and then suddenly you think, I can't bear this anymore, I, I want to change my mind. Rights to change your mind, anybody? Well, yes, yeah, so we're in Europe, so right to be forgotten is a completely different discussion than it is in the States, where they think this is crazy. Uh, I, mean, I've, I got into an argument with Jeff Jarvis about this, because he very much believes once it's up there, it's up there. And I said, look, for example, if The Guardian has an assignment where it says, 
dear readers, have any of you suffered a miscarriage? Would you like to talk about it? Or have any of you talk, can tell us about a very difficult divorce? And somebody writes back, and those comments are included in the article. If in three years' time that person changes their mind, I absolutely think that The Guardian should take that down. I, re I really do, because I think you're not paying those commenters. Um, I mean, there's logistical issues around here in a huge way. Um, but certainly, Guardian has the Guardian Witness Project, and they have in their terms of service that they will, where possible, uh, respect your rights if you want to take it down. But I think lots of news organizations would say it's impossible. But, you know, that Geordie Mears' decision to take that video down after 15 minutes, the problem is, from a public interest position, any news organization would say, we have to show that video of the police officer being shot. Um, but I feel very uncomfortable with the fact that he took that down and it got used everywhere. But maybe that's sometimes in life, shit happens. I think this might be an occasion where, I think this might be an occasion where ethics trumps, trumps the law. And, and in ethics, we're talking a lot about informed consent. And I think it's our duty to tell people exactly how their content will be used and the fact that it will be up there for forever. It will be searchable and are they happy to to proceed. Yes, we, we can, if we omit that information, it will be easier to get the, to get the interview, but it's also going to be very difficult to take it down if we, if we omit the information, you know, because we'll have to dig it out later on. I'm also wondering whether, um, you mentioned payment and things, whether it, paying eyewitnesses for, for content like this is actually going to make the situation any worse if they suddenly think, right, I can get a lot of money for creating something like that. Are there sort of additional rights that come with offering somebody money for their content? And what about the moral and ethical issues of exploiting somebody else's privacy, perhaps? I don't know if anybody dares speak on this one, but... <laughs> the dirty bunny word. Um, I don't know. I, I, a lot of these, the instances that we've seen, are, they just happen to be, you know, accidental witnesses, um, and it, it, people don't really think about that. Of course, there is the, you know, we've considered in the past that by trying to by licensing content or by pay, paying people that they're li liable to try to stage things as well and yeah. put themselves at risk but I mean I guess it's easy easy enough to debunk that that sort of stuff um, one of the things that uh, I thought was interesting um, relating to the hounding of people in those situations and Mark Little came up with this idea I think or somebody in that circle um, about this idea of a pool you know uh, news organizations uh, subscribing to this idea of, of a pool reply, and uh, I was just wondering if there's any headway made on that that anybody's aware of. That, w that, for instance, CNN could approach an eyewitness and ask them to clear it for everybody so that they don't have to deal with the barrage of communications that follows by a simple reply, uh, and there, therefore other news organizations can, can use it. And we, ha we had an example of that, didn't we, from um, the Brussels attacks? We, we've not, this is something we actually discussed this time last year and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things to tackle and the pool is, is probably going to be a really big, big thing to, to take on. But actually I think there is some self-regulation that can, that can happen in terms of a pool and our, our media is, is increasingly owned by fewer, fewer people and there are a lot of groups of news organisations and papers out there. Um, ultimately these, you know, you, you want your the papers, the publications in your groups to do well. And so it might make sense that you have, instead of all of the organizations in that group reaching out, you can, you can limit it by, by centralizing that. I mean, that, that could be a, self, a way of self-regulating a pool, but in terms of bringing the industry together on, on the competitive thing, it just kicks archive down the road. But I, I, I mean, your, your case studies were so great, but if news organizations themselves can't do a pool which says only one of us should contact them, I'm not quite sure how. No, no, no this is not easy. No. But, <laughs> I, but, but, it's, it, but there's the worry about competition, and at least if you're doing it within a group, within a, your own family, that might be a way, but we just need to tell them that. <laughs> hashtag pool. <laughs> Reply with hashtag. Um, I just also wonder about the, the, the other impact on the, the eyewitnesses themselves. Does the uh, bombardment from the journalists make the trauma of what they've seen worse? Um, is there any evidence of the sort of psychological impact of the journalists chasing you like a sort of rabbit in the headlights? Um, I read a blog post uh, recently uh, written by somebody who was there in the terminal in uh, Brussels um, uh, who sounded very traumatized, right, and was certainly very peed off about the approaches 
made by multiple news organizations, um, and uh, that's worth a, re worth a read. Um, it's on the Eyewitness Media Hub uh, website. Sam Doberly, who's here, uh, translated it. But, um, I, but he, he was, tra I said it sounded like that person was traumatized anyway, but it just added to the, uh, to the stress of the situation. But bearing in mind that, you know, news organizations do have a re responsibility to tell that story and more and more eyewitnesses are our eyes and ears on the ground. So there's a sort of a balance to be struck there. I think we need to remember that in all of this conversation. But At all times, remember, we have a duty of care to them. I think perhaps thinking of our audiences, we have an audience here who maybe have some questions. Um, would anybody like to say something? Obviously, it struck you about how badly behaved journalists can be. But has anybody perhaps been in this situation where you've been an eyewitness to something? A question at the front here. Hi, um, I'm an independent documentary producer for BBC Radio 4 and BBC World Service. Um, I have been in situations where I've actually walked away from um, quite a long time ago before social media got going, uh, where I've been in a situation, this was in India, uh, during where, where there was a lot of Sikh attacks going on in Delhi. and. Uh, I was just amazed at how quickly the international news crews descended in the situation and just a lot of people didn't speak English and I didn't speak English. I was being asked to start interpreting um, and I was still trying to make sense of what was going on and I found myself torn between putting on my journalist hat and just thinking this is wrong, you shouldn't be approaching people like this, you know, and I do think that the general public, particularly in the West, are now much more clued up to how social media operates. They've seen these reports where social media accounts have been taken in, eyewitnesses are called in. So we're almost part of this sort of joint game in this reporting. But what I was really sort of, what the question I wanted to ask was, as consumers, as users of these platforms, what are the sorts of things that we should be doing to I was really shocked. I don't use Instagram very much, apart from posting out holiday pictures. I was shocked at the idea that somebody might take a picture of mine and, and use it. Are there things like this that all of us should be just much more alert to what we do and don't post? Claire, would you like to take that one? No, I mean, I think that's why I would love... Uh, I mean, again, it's not really in Instagram's interest to, to tell you all of this, because they want as much content as possible. But even on your own Instagram account, if you look at the little map on your profile, most of you probably have got geolocation turned on. So I could look at any of your Instagram accounts, if they're public, and I could see where you went on holiday, and I could see your pictures from Perugia. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's sometimes we think, you know, can we get a storyline on a soap opera or something? Like, we need something that makes more people aware of these issues. Um, and I think there are literacy classes in schools, but, you know, I'm often overwhelmed. Even with our journalism students, I say, okay, so you take an Instagram picture now, um, and then you upload it. Who owns it? And almost all of them say, oh, Instagram does. And I say, well, no, actually, you own, you own the copyright that, and there's a copyright law in the room, so I won't go any further. Um, but, you know, I think the, the basic understanding of that, most people have no idea. So I think there really is a need for some public awareness campaigns about this. And it goes beyond, do you understand privacy on Facebook? It's exactly that. Do you know that your tweet, which, yes, is technically public, could, without you even knowing, without you being alerted, be put on the front page of BuzzFeed? That's a fundamental change for you of the way that you expected your content to be used. So... I'd love to see a public awareness campaign but around that. I, I, something that is not directly related to news, but something that shocks me and, and kind of illustrates how people don't think about what they're doing is, you know, people create, you know, everyone likes to check in on Facebook when they're going on holiday. But actually, so many people like to check in, they create a place to check in at home. So they check in on Facebook at home, you know, while I'm at home enjoying, and then, they, and then they're checking in when they're at the airport going on holiday, and then they're checking in when, I know where they live, and I know that they're not there. And I know that, I know that, and you know, so you've got to th start thinking about these things from, from your, that's not journalists, that's, your, that's your personal safety or your, the security of your home, but it's the real world and it can be found, you know, it's not, it's not this little dreamland that, that just exists on a computer or on a mobile phone. Again, that's uh, something we need to educate ourselves, but everyone needs to look and see about you know, geolocated data and stuff on your phone. And be aware that if you are posting stuff on social, and your kids, your dog, 
everything like that. It could easily be taken down and used in evidence against you. Um, I do want to just uh, plug again for the copyright um, uh, workshop after this, later this afternoon. Uh, what time? When, when, oh, sorry. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Mm. Okay, four o'clock. For anybody who needs to know about rights, because certainly I think that we've seen breaches of copyright left, right, and centre. Um, yes, do. The other thing is, is that these companies are getting incredibly clever in terms of photo recognition. So, for example, mm. this is a bit bad, but imagine I would, somebody took a picture of me now drinking this delicious can of Coca-Cola. The companies are screening social media content for people using their logo and then using in advertising. So there's a whole host of stuff that people have no idea how sophisticated these brands are, let alone news organizations. User-generated content is essentially big money. It's free content. Um, permissions is one thing, but once you start looking at how smart the technology is around facial recognition, that's the huge thing in Silicon Valley right now, plus artificial intelligence. We're, you know, we'll be talking about this at many conferences to come, but it's going to be a completely different environment in just a year's time. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your contributions. A very quick question, because I'm a student and I have no idea really um, how this could happen, but I have a question. Um, I was surprised that yesterday when I had a look at my Facebook uh, page, um, actually today, it says that I am a volunteer at the festival, but I never mentioned that I'm at all at the festival, and there are no pictures of me there, and I just befriended several people that are volunteers, and Facebook um, already uh, supposes that I am a volunteer as well. So, it's... <laughs> yes, it's terrifying. I, 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 I can't I just, speak... I just wanted to share, my, to share my experience because I never... Uh, there is nothing else saying right. that I'm even here. And it's already sa saying that I am a volunteer. I, I can't speak t to that specific example um, or, or how that got on there, but I, it reminds me of another story I heard recently with some journalists who's... Um, you know, making the decision when your kids get a cell phone, it's kind of a big decision, especially if it's a smartphone. And so a, a journalist I was talking with recently said that they'd gotten their daughter a, a, a cell phone, um, but it hadn't, like, hadn't gotten them on any, like, WhatsApp or Snapchat or any of these other services and was, like, trying to maintain her privacy and a little bit of a wall around her. She's fairly young. Um, and then all of a sudden, she started getting emails from services like like uh, WhatsApp and Snapchat saying, oh, so-and-so wants to friend you. So-and-so wants to friend you. And it turns out, because these services scan your address book, all of her relatives who put her phone number in their email in their address book, all of a sudden, all these platforms knew exactly what her phone number was, even though they had never been made public. And so she was being included in these apps and stuff like that. So how our information leaks out is just another, another thing to be aware of. Um, I wanted to say one other thing about how, I guess with that in mind, how we can help eyewitnesses. And I think transparency is a huge part of this. We're not gonna do a case study after every single story we do. But when there's a really extraordinary story that was really helped by eyewitness media, I can see a news organization taking a step back and, and even putting an editor's note or something on it saying, here's how we did this, here's how we got this story. Um, you think that people don't wanna see how the sausage is made in terms of how news comes together, but people are actually really fascinated by that. And ethically, it helps you explain how you got that. We were doing a session two days ago about how you can track down people online when you're trying to verify things in breaking news. And Craig Silverman was going through a case study and all of a sudden he sort of stopped and said, I realize how creepy this all sounds because with tools that we have now, you can get people's addresses, you can zoom in with Google images of their house, you can do all this stuff, right? Um, so if we are more transparent about that and talk about the how behind the, the stories that we do. I think that that can take us a long way too, both educating each other, uh, but also being transparent about how we are interacting with eyewitnesses. Were there any other questions? Oh yes. Oh, I've got a Sorry. Uh, thank you all. I have a, earlier this year, Facebook released Facebook Live so that you know, users can uh, stream videos. And uh, recently Periscope has been offering the same service. Um, and I'm just wondering, and Snapchat has new media outlets giving their stories, and I, I was wondering how, if you see eyewitnesses gonna, are going to be offering live video to news outlets soon. Like, I can imagine a future where we send our snaps to CNN um, and they end up on TV. Um, and if that would, how does that complicate the safety of eyewitnesses? Um, or is this already in conversation? 
Yep, so if you looked at the Brussels attacks, there were a number of live streams from Brussels, and some news organisations were directly taking those streams and putting them directly out on air. And we had a, a discussion a couple of days ago about the ethics of directly embedding a live stream when you have no idea what's going to happen. Imagine in Brussels there was a third explosion and it was live on Facebook Live. I mean, something terrible will happen and the Facebook will have to respond and Periscope probably with a delay or something like that. Um, but there are issues around permissions as usual. People have, they have to ask permission to, to use the stream. But there's a lot there about graphic content. We did a case study of the Bangkok bombing in August when an eyewitness happened to just walk just after the bomb exploded and he went live on Periscope and was walking around saying, oh, there's a hat. Oh, shit, that's somebody's brains. Oh, my God, that's an arm. Like, and he was completely shocked as an eyewitness and there was all these love hearts going up the side because it was Periscope. Um, he's not a trained journalist. So there's live... Um, live video and what that means for all of the questions that we're discussing here. Um, it's just taking a lot of them to just another level. We're going to really have to think about the ethical consequences of live video. There were two in instances in the States recently where um, two men in Miami and in Chicago uh, live streamed their own uh, shootings. Uh, one of them died and the other guy's uh, in hospital. And, uh, uh, you know, that's another instance of, of how live... Um, sort of brings it into a different realm in terms of ethics and what, what's, um, what's going to be displayed. And you know, one of the conversations that, uh, that we had with, with a journalist in The Guardian recently was, you know, when is ISIS going to live stream on Facebook a, a beheading? You know, because the, the platforms, who's, who's monitoring live on those platforms? Um, and where's that responsibility? Um, and the idea came up of a, of a delay. Did you mention that just there as well? Of, yeah, of, of, of incorporating delays to identify that sort of stuff. And of course, you'll remember the, the shooting um, live on air last year of two journalists by a former colleague. And, uh, and he filmed that and later posted it onto his, uh, his accounts. Now, the platforms responded very quickly to that. I think eight minutes and, and 15 minutes, respectively, it was down off those platforms. But again, that was taken and it was all over YouTube uh, at that stage. Um, so I don't know what the technical means are to, 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 to moderate that um, in, in real time. but something to, to look at. And just very briefly, just to sort of wind this up, um, obviously we're talking about what it means to protect the eyewitness in the social media age. Just a few short tips from each of you to take away. What do you want the journalists here and the wider audience to, to know about this issue? If we work our way back up the line, Josh, do you want to start? I think for me the key takeaway is um, to take the best practices that you want to see in your colleagues in your newsroom and begin to educate and engage your communities on those same ideas. Um, learn about the about security and those tips that are uh, provided by the EFF and the Intercept. They're very simple, very simple things. Um, and something that I heard in a previous workshop um, around uh, your emotional response to to stories, and this applies also to um, treating eyewitnesses as how we treat eyewitnesses, is to have a workflow and to follow that workflow uh, and that system, and to spread that across the newsroom so it's it's understood. And of course you'll review that and moderate that as, uh, as, as uh, big stories happen um, and mistakes happen, but uh, generally having just a set of, of rules and even checklists uh, help journalists and enable journalists. Um, treat people as you would wish to be treated um, and, and consider your, that your actions are public and, and what image that gives of you. And I think getting to Maliki's point, um, actually often newsrooms in a breaking news situation, it's very stressful. That's not the time to reflect. But the Tunisia beat shooting was actually a week after Charlie Hebdo. And we had journalists from certain organizations saying, you know what, we had a review of how we acted during the Charlie Hebdo shootings. And as a reaction to that, the way that we treated eyewitnesses, not those ones that you showed, um, but they said we were actually, we did things differently for the Tunisia attacks. So I think we have to just recognize that every story is different, but yet there's a lot of fundamentals here. And I think newsrooms to actually have brown bag lunches and scenarios that involve these sorts of case studies uh, will mean that when, that when this does happen, the whole newsroom from editors down to the 22-year-old social media you know, editor knows really what they should be doing. So. Thank you very much, everybody. I think that was a, a fantastic um, session. And a quick round of applause from everybody. And don't forget the copyright um, workshop, 4 o'clock. Um, but thanks very much. Thank you.